Oh, 
Welcome to you. We've come together to bring our praise to God. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him for the Lord is a great God, a great King, above all gods. And so we'll stand together and we'll sing out our praise to God be the glory.
choose to do that, to give you the glory, to bring our praise to you. And Lord, we thank you for the great things you have done. And we thank you that we can come to you, the Father, through Jesus, the Son. So we give you glory and praise. Amen. Shall we say hello to somebody, greet somebody, welcome somebody? While we're doing that, children, if you'd like to grab an instrument... Okay, we're just distributing some instruments to the children. If you want an instrument, we're going to stand up again in a moment. You can, you can rest for a second. Come and grab yourself an instrument. Oh, okay. Right. We're going to continue in our praise. Let's stand together. We come and bring our thanksgiving to God. Oh, what? 
Okay, we like to sit down. We're, we're collecting the instruments in as well. There you go. Bob's going to whip around that, that box there. And um, if um, children, you can sort your instruments, but you need to find your sheet. We've uh, got uh, March fines. We'll explain that in a moment. So see if you can find that. So you can sort your instrument, find your, your sheet of paper there. And uh, yeah, we'll share uh, some, some bits of information. Uh, and... Um, we had a church meeting last week. Should we just kind of talk about what happened after that? Oh, yes. That should be working. Uh, at the back there? Hello, at the back there. Can we have some mic on this red one here? Thank you. Okay. That's not <laughs> working. There right. it is. Brilliant. Right, thank you. Last week, a great church meeting, and we were able to appoint Jordan as our children's worker. Yeah! <laughs> So next week. So next week we're going to have a church members meeting as well. It's yeah. about budget and finance. Yeah, don't forget watch the video. It's a great, yeah. it's epic. <laughs> a lot longer than I thought it was, but there you yeah, go. Yeah, it's like a movie. It's like you a and movie. John. It is. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. before that, in the service, we're going to commission Jordan and pray for him. So come along, especially families, children, come along. Yeah. Um, and be part of that. So we're going to pray for him and welcome him sort of in the service. And then after the service, we're going to have cake. And a uh, really nice party cake to celebrate. So come along for Jordan's commissioning service for cake and then the church meeting. At 12 noon, yeah. So after cake. Brilliant. Uh, and then we've got a, a, an opportunity for, with the uh, young adults, I think it is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. On a Thursday. It's for everybody. Yep. Um, but that's a week Thursday on the 7th at 7 o'clock. We're going to meet up here and Luke and band are going to lead us in worship for an hour, an hour and a half to really focus on worship, to have space, um, to receive from God, to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit. We'll have some refreshments 
Um, and it's going to be vibrant. So yeah. I looked up the meaning of the word vibrant, because having put it in, I thought, I wonder what that means. And it means dynamic, energetic, full of life and exciting. That'd so don't great. miss it. That'd be great. And I remember that you're saying that we need to pray more in 24. So I thought we could say, and we need to worship more in 24. Yes. yes. <laughs> Most so definitely. just a really great opportunity because we don't get time in our lives to do that. So that's a week Thursday. Book, week it, book it out. What time is that? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock up here in the auditorium. Up here in the auditorium. Just, um, yeah. just worship. Okay. So that's come out. So register with those two things, two important things. Amongst many other things, you need to look on Facebook. You need to be uh, looking at the website, see what's happening. Okay. Now we're going to turn to these sheets, aren't we? And, and it's nearly March. Isn't it? So we've got, uh, there's two sides to the sheet. You can see them up there. And uh, Here's uh, a challenge for you to do in March, you, especially the children, but you could take one as adults as well. And on your walking, you've got to find all these things and tick them off. And then if they bring the sheet back to you, is there a prize? Well, uh, they could be, <laughs> if you can get them all, if because you can there's get some real challenges March, on there. So you've got to find a catkin and a muddy puddle and a frog and That's a, a snow. lamb. And snow. There's not going to be any prizes. <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. We're getting a great prize. You can do somebody who now brings Unless some snow you're going in. skiing or going up to Scotland. But we need a photo of the snow. We need proof that you've seen snow. And if you get them all, Auntie's going to give you a prize. Yes, but um, go. I'm sure some of these, well, especially a rain cloud, you could do easily. Well, some of them are a lot easier than others. I've noticed on there. Um, but there you go. There's a, there's a challenge. Because we're, we're sort of moving into that season. We're in season of Lent. It's nearly March, it's nearly spring, it's nearly Easter, it's going to get lovely weather soon, but you can still look for some snow. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so that's one side of the sheet, okay? So you can take that away. On the other side of the sheet is things that we're going to be praying for in March. Because we want to be praying, we want to be worshipping, we want to be praying, we want to be full of thanksgiving. And on our sheet there, and you can see it up on the screen, I'll give you the, uh, in the pedals there's some different words. And uh, we're going we're gonna to do this now for a couple of minutes. So if you haven't got a sheet, you can say, this is what uh, I'm, I'm thanking God for in this season as we move from February into March. Here, here are others that I'm praying for as we intercede for others as we move from February into March. Here are key places that I'm praying about. Could be your home, could be your workplace, could be a country could be a place. Here's a friend. We're encouraged, aren't we, when we do thy kingdom come, to be praying for those who are friends to come to faith and to know Jesus. Here are the, the people, my friends I'm praying for. And it's got on the other pedal. Um, please, God, we're asking you, God, to do this. This is what I'm asking you to do, God, as we move from February into March, as we go towards Easter, this is what I'm asking you to. Then the last petal and the middle bit of the flower is empty. And you can add in other words and other prayers there. You're not going to be able to do it all, but in the next few moments, maybe you want to start one of those, one of those petals, either thanks or others or places or friends or please God prayers, and just uh, uh, spend a couple of minutes just talking about that, but then let's talk to God about it, yeah? And then I'll lead us in a prayer together in a moment. So you've got things to look for in March and things, people, situations we're praying for as we move from February into March. Let's do that now together. Well done. A few moments together. So you can turn to each other yeah, and let's have a do quick that, conversation. Please. Let's, <laughs> let's do that. So, yeah, no good looking at us now. You've got to look at each other to do that bit. You can think about where you're going to find snow.
Okay, 30 seconds, then we're going to come back together. So, final part. And uh, it's a really helpful exercise, isn't it? Just to sort of plot out some things that we're going to be praying about. Kind of create your own sort of little prayer guide for, for March. So uh, um, don't just sort of park it now. Maybe take this beyond our gathered worship into your own praying as we go into uh, a new month together. I've got this prayer. Powerful life. Almighty God, we welcome the new life and hope of spring filled with wonder and praise at how you create and faithfully sustain every atom of the universe, renewing us each day to live for you. May we be responsible stewards and use the power in our hands for the benefit of others and to the glory of God your name. Power for life. Lord, we thank you for natural and renewable sources of power, such as wind and sunlight and water and tidal flows and bioenergy. We pray that these resources will benefit everyone, whether rich or poor, and will be used in ways that do not harm the environment. Power for life. Heavenly Father, we remember people who feel weak and helpless because of health problems or other overwhelming circumstances. May they be supported by family, friends and others caring for them and recognise their need of your salvation, of your healing and of your peace. And Lord, we bring these words of prayer, of praying for others and praying for places and praying prayers of thanksgiving and praying for our friends and asking you, Lord, to do great, marvellous, grace things in our lives and in other people's lives. And we're going to say these words together on the screen now together as we pray. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Great. We're going to um, go to some different parts of the building. Some of us, not all of us, some of us. So, children, you're going to move off to uh, your groups. Uh, youth, you're going to go down to your area down there. And again, if you're visiting here, you've got children here, young people here with you. like them to be involved in our all-age programme. We're, we're kind of moving now. And uh, there'll be people there who will point you in the right direction for the right age group, for the right place. That would be really good. There you go. It's on the screen there for you. And uh, for us back in here, uh, Abby's going to uh, take us to the mountain of worship in Matthew's Gospel. And before we do that, we're going to have the opportunity uh, leading into that to uh, uh, express worship and then flowing out of that to be those that worship. And then as we're sent to go on being whole life worshippers, James, I wonder if we could just flick the screens across so we can, uh, I can move my um, pitch. Thank you very much. So,
This prayer that uh, we use sometimes during Lent. Holy God, our lives are laid open before you. Rescue us from the chaos of sin. And through the death of your Son, bring us healing and make us whole. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so the psalmist who invites us to come and sing to the Lord, to uh, uh, bring praise to God, also invites us, let us worship. Come. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. Come, let us worship. Shall we do that? Shall we seize these moments to bring our worship and then to come to God's word and then to bring our worship and then to go out from this place and live a life of worship? Well, perhaps we'll start standing, but you may feel as we're moving through this time that you want to sit down, that you want to kneel down in worship. But let's come as a worshipping people. Let's stand together. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come. And knowing the battle's won. For you have never failed me yet. still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands and this is my confidence you've never felt me Always enough, oh, Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love, and my heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. I see you 
And the tempest roars, you are with me. When creation falls, so my soul will soar on your mercy. And I walk through the fire with my head lifted high. And my spirit revived in your story And I look to the cross as my Savior is lost In the light of your glorious grace So let the ruins come to life In the beauty of your name Rising up from the ashes God forever you reign so we'll find refuge in the shadow of your wings. I will love you forever and forever I'll sing. And when the world caves in, still my hope will cling to your promise. When my courage ends, let my heart find strength in your presence. And I walk through the fire with my head lifted high and my spirit revived in your story. And I look to the cross as my failure is lost. In the light of your glorious grace Oh, let the ruins come to life In the beauty of your name Rising up from the ashes God, forever you reign And my soul will find refuge In the shadow of your wings How will Well, let the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name, rising up from the ashes. God, forever you reign, and my soul will find refuge in the shadow of your wings. I will love you forever, and forever I'll see. Come home, don't run, God is for you, waiting for you, don't turn back in shame, God is with you, He is with you, wait for the Lord, be strong. 
Let your heart take courage. All peace will come. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. You have been away for far too long. See why. Your tears, no more mourning, no more crying, and He will be your new beginning, a new beginning. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart. calling you to come home and he's free oh he's redeeming he's awakening your soul he's waiting and he's waiting and he's longing and he's calling you to come home free oh he's redeeming he's awakening your soul wait for the Lord be strong and let your heart take courage oh peace will come wait for the Lord be strong your heart take courage oh peace will come wait for the Lord be strong you have been away for far too long so come home oh so come home Lord, we're so grateful that we can be in your presence. We can worship you. Know that grace touch of your love and salvation upon our lives. For that invitation to to come and worship and to come home and to know you. Lord, in your loving kindness, be at work, we pray, in our lives.
And Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the Word of God. Lord, help us to be a Word of God, Spirit of God people, gathered and sent. And so help us, Lord, as we turn to the, our Bible now. Lord, we pray for Abby. Lord, we thank you for Abby and her ministry among us. Lord, we thank you for her. We pray for her. And we pray for one another. And Lord, help us to uh, hear what you're saying to us and to then work that out into our life and living. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Please sit down. Thank you, Abby. Morning. So, as Anthony's already mentioned, um, we're carrying on with our um, series on the mountains that we find in Matthew. So these were mountains where Jesus did something significant. And today we're talking about the temptation of Jesus and the worship that he had in that place of tempting. So the reading today is from Matthew 8, uh, sorry, Matthew 4, verses 8 to 10. Uh, and for those with the church Bible, that's on page 734 if you want to read along. <laughs> Got someone else talking here about clearing their clutter. Um, <laughs> This is the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and he became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off, for the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. I'm getting quite a bit of echo on this mic. Is everyone hearing okay? Do you want me to switch? A bit closer. Thank you. So, um, Jesus is going on to a trip into the wilderness and into remoteness, and he's going to be tempted. So, we're going to go on a bit of a wilderness journey this morning. And I want you to imagine, first of all, that you are traveling to somewhere very remote. Uh, perhaps you're going wild camping. Uh, perhaps you're going up a mountain, as we did a few years ago, walked up Ben Nevis. Or perhaps you're going somewhere far more exotic, like a camel riding in the desert. My husband's done that one, not me. Um, the trip's going to take you a long way from hell, and you have to carry everything you need on your back, or maybe with an animal if you've got one of those with you, and there's going to be no phone signal, shock horror. Um, what would be the first tool or piece of equipment that you would want to take to you, with you into the wilderness or into the remoteness? Have a chat to people next to you and come up with one tool that you would want to take and why you would want to take it.
Right. Now I'm hoping, I know I haven't given you long, um, I'm hoping we've got a few ideas. So Anne is very kindly going to come around with Mike. Can, is anyone happy just to share what their, what their thing was and why they wanted to take it with them? Anyone brave enough to do that? Why is it always the other side of the room? <laughs> <laughs> just we want you to jog, Anne. <laughs> We'd take a water bottle. Water bottle. Excellent. Fix that in. Other ideas, it doesn't, it, it, this, it, this isn't like an examination question, you know, there's not necessarily a right and wrong here. A torch. A torch, like it. Let's see where we're going. A water steriliser. Oh, yes. Multi-purpose shovel. Oh, yes. Has lots of uses. <laughs> Any others? Personal survival kit. A pers You're going for the whole thing, aren't you? Yeah, I like that. I like that. Andy would take a Doctor Who screwdriver. Does this need to be a working one? As in, it actually does what the Doctor Who screwdriver does. I'm gonna, that would be extremely take, useful. Sorry. Take some matches. Matches. Brilliant. Thank you for that. So, um, um, if you're going into the wilderness... Um, the, the main needs that we have are food, water, and shelter. You've all heard it before. I'm sure most of us have probably watched a Bear Grylls uh, episode of some nature or other. Um, so perhaps if you're going on a short camping trip, it might be that you would just take what you need in terms of a bit of camping gear, water, food, um, and that would do you for a short period of time. If you were going somewhere much more remote then you're talking proper survival kit. So you're going for the knife and you're going for some way to start fire and you're going for ways to keep yourself warm. And our passage today finds Jesus being led into the wilderness, but there is no mention of him carrying such things with him um, because for this period in the wilderness and this period of testing, Jesus will require some very different sort of survival tools. We're going to come on to what those are a little later. But let's just have a little look at our passage again and just ask the question first, why is Jesus going into the wilderness? Well, for anyone that doesn't know that particular part of the Bible well at the moment, you might not know that Jesus has just been baptised. In the chapter before, Jesus has been baptised by his cousin John in the River Jordan. The Holy Spirit has descended upon him and God has pronounced from heaven, this is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And then the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. But why? What, what's the point? Why does he need to go? Well, Jesus goes because he knows it's part of God's plan. God is going to use him to rescue his people. And God has tried different ways, as we read through the Old Testament, to try and save us, to save us from the things that we do wrong. One of the things that he did was to create a holy people, the people of Israel. And he took them on a very similar journey as he's taking Jesus on now. He saved them from uh, slavery in Egypt. He crossed them across the um, sea, the seas parted, and he was saved. Um, they were saved from the pursuing Egyptian army. And they took them when into the wilderness. And God tested them in the wilderness. But unfortunately, that testing did not go well. Um, and Israel, unfortunately, failed quite a few times with some of the tests that came their way. How did they fail? Well, they failed to trust in God's provision. They failed to worship only him. They started worshipping other things. And they also regularly tried to test God, not satisfied with all that he was giving them, despite the fact he was doing great miracles and wonders. They wanted more, and so they kept trying to test. And so Jesus walks willingly into the wilderness to face this testing. And the first thing Jesus does is to start fasting. Now, don't know about you, I am not good without food. Um, does anyone else get hangriness? Yes, yeah, I, I get hangry. You can speak to my family, bless them. They've had to put up with that for a number of years. I'm slightly better now I've got a little bit older, but I still get hangry. And to be honest, the thought of missing even a few meals 
fills me and probably those close to me with dread. Um, and yet Jesus sets about not just a short-term fast, but a major one. As we've already read in verse 2, it says, He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he became very hungry. I think that's like the understatement of the century. In fact, if you look at the original um, uh, Greek uh, wording of the passage, it literally just says he was hungry. Uh, and a lot of our uh, Bible translations try and emphasize that a bit more by saying he was famished or he was very hungry. But why is he fasting? Well, fasting isn't just about abstaining from food. For someone from a Jewish background, they would know that fasting isn't just about giving up the food, but about meditating on scripture, about praying, about worship. The time that you would spend eating, you instead spend worshiping, you spend praying. So although it doesn't explicitly mention it in the passage, what we're seeing here by um, Jesus starting to fast is that he is starting to worship God, and he is worshipping God in his wilderness. I think there's also probably a second reason for the fasting, and that is ultimately that for the testing to be complete, he knows he needs to be tested at the point he is at his weakest as a human. Now, there's great variation in terms of how long a human body can survive without food. Uh, many people would actually die before 40 days. Some can last for longer. But regardless, Jesus would have been at a very weak point, certainly from a nutrition point of view, by the time that the devil comes to test him. Jesus would be desperate for food. So it's probably of no surprise then that the first testing that comes his way is around food. In verse 3, it says, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Could Jesus have turned those stones into bread? Absolutely. Of course he could. Later in the Gospels, we see that Jesus multiplied food. Um, he turned water into wine. It was perfectly possible for him, with his godly power, to do that. But he doesn't. So why doesn't he? Well, it's because, as we've already mentioned, that the testing at this point that the devil is doing is just as what he did to the Israelites before. And he is testing to see whether Jesus will trust God's provision, even in extremis, or whether he won't. So Jesus knows that to pass the test, he must be completely reliant on God's provision, even when he is at his weakest. And this is where we start to see what is in Jesus' survival kit. <coughs> So rather than the fire starters or the knife or the warm clothing that we were talking about earlier, he brings different things to his survival or to his wilderness. And the first is to trust in God's plan. Though things are looking very bleak, Jesus doesn't turn away. He trusts that God will end his fast when the right time is there for it to end. The second tool that he takes with him is correct use of scripture. So we've heard already that he rebukes the devil by the use of scripture, by the use of what's written in the Bible. So Jesus does not turn the stone into bread, and he passes the first test of trusting in God's provision. The second test, we've already heard, the devil takes him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and he says, if you're the son of God... Jump off, for the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands and you will not hurt your foot on the stone. You note in what the devil's doing here. He's cunning. He's thinking, aha, first time I tested him, he rebuked me scripture. Now I'm going to try and catch him out using scripture. Now the second temptation sometimes takes a little more consideration. What was it? that the devil was trying to do at this point. I think sometimes when we talk about him being high up, we think, oh, well, he's just telling him to throw himself off because he wants to, for him to kill himself. He wants to get him out of the way. But as we can see from Jesus' reply, this testing isn't about that. It isn't about whether he'll give up or not. It's about whether he'll trust God with when he is going to be revealed as the son of God to the wider masses. If he jumped off that building and God came to his rescue right at that point, people would see it. They're in Jerusalem. Loads of people there. But what Jesus says is, I'm not going to do that. 
And he says, but I will not test the Lord my God. I will wait. I'm not going to test that he will rescue me. I'm not going to test that he will reveal my glory at the right time. I'm going to trust that he will do just that. And again, he submits to God. Then comes the third test. And this is where the worship comes back in again. Jesus is taken to the peak of a very high mountain from which the devil shows him all the riches and glories of the kingdoms. Now we kind of imagine that although he might have been up a physical mountain to see all the glories of all the kingdoms, there probably was a bit of imagination required there. They weren't all in the same place at the same time. Um, And the devil says to him, I will give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. And at this point, the third tool in Jesus' survival kit comes out. So, he's trusted in God's plan. He's used scripture. And he worships. But he doesn't worship the devil. He worships God. He knows that God is there and that he needs to worship him. And so Jesus passed all the tests that the Israelites before him failed to do. So what can we learn from Jesus' testing? What can we get from this passage? Firstly, we need to trust God when we're in the wilderness. Now, whether that's a wilderness that's come through his guidance, sometimes God leads us very directly into a wilderness. Sometimes that wilderness may come on us because we're in a very difficult world. We're in a world that's fallen, lots of stuff goes wrong. We can have difficult times. But regardless, we need to worship God even when we're in the wilderness. I can hear you say, oh, that's great, Abby. That's easier said than done, isn't it? How do you worship when you're really struggling? And the first thing to remember and to take courage from is you're not doing it alone. Jesus has been in the wilderness many times to an extreme that we hopefully will never have to face. So we have a great tour guide. We aren't on our own. He can lead you through the wilderness. But there's also some other tools that we can use. Um, We can remember the past. It's important to remember where God has turned up for us before, where we've heard God speak before. If we're struggling to hear God, and sometimes that happens, doesn't it, in the wilderness, that can sometimes be the place that's quite difficult. Remember what God has done for you before. Remember what God has done for other people you know before. Remember what God has done in the Bible for the people in the Bible. And take courage from it. Read the Bible and remember its promises, just as Jesus used scripture to help him get himself out of difficult situations we can do exactly the same. If you are really, really struggling with something, find a few passages. Talk to people around you saying, I'm struggling with this. What would be a good passage for me at the moment? What would be a good promise that is in the Bible that I can speak? And you speak it out, and you do it again and again. Encourage yourself. Wildernesses do not last forever. Don't withdraw. How easy is it when we're struggling in a wilderness place to say, I'm just not going to go to church. I'm not going to go to that small group. I'm not going to do my prayer or my Bible study or my lectio or whatever it is that we do to study God's word in the morning or in the afternoon, whatever you may do. Don't withdraw, come. And even if you can't sing, if life is so difficult you can't sing, or you can't pray, just sit there and listen to the praises that are going on around you, for it stirs the heart. And we see this regularly in the Bible. We see that the psalmists, when they were at their, their most upset, I mentioned this before in my last preach, when they were at the most upset, they used, they stirred themselves up by remembering what happened before. Psalm 43, verse 5 says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. 
And again, if words fail you, for those that can speak in tongues, do that. If you can't use words, draw something, write something, but do not stop trying to worship. We sing a song here, don't we, about broken hallelujahs. It's not always easy to sing our hallelujahs out when we're in a difficult place. But do it. Do it. And tell other people. Don't sit in the wilderness on your own. Tell others. Let others pray for you. Let others stand with you and encourage you. Now, there are a couple of things in particular that I felt God prompted me on when I was looking at this particular session and looking at wilderness. And one of them was about prolonged wilderness. And I think there is another type of wilderness that we can sometimes face where we get stuck in a state of wilderness because because of something we're doing or because of something we haven't done. It can be quite a dry and barren or remote land if we don't forgive people, if we fester on something that is negative, if we continue to punish ourselves for something that God has already forgiven you for. And if you feel that that might be you today, if you feel you might be stuck in a prolonged wilderness, then tell others, come and get prayer. Please don't try and deal with it alone, but let's try and move out of that season together. And I also wanted to mention about fasting, um, because for many people in our country today, um, There's difficulties with food. People have difficult relationships with food. Many are withdrawing from food, not taking food, in a way to try and help them feel more in control. And I know for those individuals, sometimes any mention of fasting can be a trigger. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole preach around that, but I do just want to say a couple of things. And the first is that I believe that Jesus fasted to an extreme on that mountain so that we do not need to. Um, And I believe that God can give us the tools to help us get out of that situation. Now, I'm not underestimating the enormity of that task. But again, please, if that is you and you are struggling with that, talk to friends around you. Talk to us. Pray with people around you. And let's try and walk out of that season for however long it takes together. Galatians 5, 1 says, It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened by a yoke of slavery. The second thing these passages teach us is about the word of God. We've mentioned it a few times and the power in the word of God. There is great power in God's word and the more we know of it, the greater our ability to use it when we're in a wilderness season to defend us from the attacks of the devil. But just like any dual-edged sword, I think there's also an importance for us as Christians to be careful guardians of God's word and to not allow others or even anyone amongst us to use God's word inappropriately to control or to condemn. Um, One of our lecturers at university is a specialist on violence in the Bible. Um, And one of the things that she often talks about is how scripture can sometimes be used in an unhelpful way to encourage women who are in domestic violence to stay quiet. And that would be an example of a way in which scripture is not being used as God intended it. So how do we take care with scripture? We should remember that scripture, the Bible, was written for a time and a place and a culture, which is not ours. So we do need to bear in mind the context in which it was written. It's important not just to take individual verses of the Bible without understanding the passage in which they were written. What was it people were trying to say at that time? Um, What was the emphasis of the message that people would have understood if they'd been reading that whole chapter? Let's, be, um, let's exercise our use of swordmanship. I, mean, I don't know if anyone's young enough, if, old enough like me to remember sword drills with the Bible. Anyone used to do that in Bible studies? You, people used to call out a passage and you had to get to it as quickly as possible and put it up in the air to say that you'd got to... It was a way of trying to encourage young people to know their way around the Bible. So it was, it was called sword drill. They actually used to call it sword drill. We used to have to put out our Bibles. 
But let's use our, but let's know our Bibles so that we can use them the way that God intended. Let's use them as a sword in which to defeat the enemy. Um, and accountability is another way of doing that. Maybe you think, oh, I don't really know much about scripture, or I've come across this scripture and I'm not sure if this is the right use of it. Talk to those around you. Talk to your brothers and sisters in Christ. They have experience. Encourage one another. And also, we can help correct one another if we're starting to go off on a slight tangent that maybe wasn't what was intended. Then we can correct one another. So be accountable. Be open. And the last thing that I just wanted to leave us with, really, was a challenge from this passage. Whom or what do I worship when I'm not in church? Jesus worshipped God in the wilderness when he was weakest, when no one else was watching him. He worshipped God with his whole life. Do I do the same? We are called to be whole life worshippers, not just people that come and worship at set points of our week and then forget it at the rest of our week. Do we worship when we're not in church? When we're in the wilderness? When we're at work? Not easy, I know. When we're dealing with children, that one can also be not easy, I know. <laughs> um, and if I'm not worshipping God here, then does that mean I'm actually worshipping someone else in those scenarios, in some of those places? You see, worship of God should not be a chore or an activity or something we fit into schedules, although it is good to have some schedules. It's good to be able to have times of worship. It's good to be able to have times of quiet time. Um, but it's meant to be a pleasure. It's meant to be freeing and rejuvenating and enjoyable. Um, and I think it's as much as about the snatched moments when you praise God whilst filling the dishwasher. Anyone done that? Clean bathrooms. I do a lot of worship in clean bathrooms. Not a fan of cleaning bathrooms. Really not. But I get great worship sessions out of it. So that's great. Um, things like when you look at the bird on the bird feeder... Thank you, God, for that bird. When we hear a worship song or a passive Bible comes to mind and you join in with that passion, yes, God, that's, that's amazing. Thank you. We're reading a book in college at the moment, A.W. Tozer. Uh, he was a minister back in the 19... Well, he, I think he passed away in the 50s, actually, so he's quite a long time ago. Um, but one of the things he says is this, and that's it's slight old language, so bear with me here. God is the most winsome, that means fresh, attractive, and appealing, for those of us that don't use that word anymore. God is the most winsome of all beings, and in our worship of him, we should find true pleasure. So are you finding pleasure in your worship of God? And are you still able to worship God in the wilderness? Shall we pray together? Father, I thank you for your word and for the true joy that can be found in worship of you. God, help us to rediscover the art of worshipping you in our whole lives, whether we are in the wilderness or not. Jesus, help us to be true worshippers just like you, able to trust, even in the most difficult of circumstances, in your faithfulness and in your provision. Holy Spirit, reveal in us today if we have any areas of our life which are causing us to remain in a prolonged wilderness. May we be true worshippers for you, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, filled with your joy and not just people who attend church and then don't worship for the rest of the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. gives us the opportunity to, to make a decision as we move from gather to sent worship that this is our choice, this is our desire that we would worship you, Lord. So it's more than just singing this song now. This is application, this is decision of the will we're going to worship you Lord should we stand together
this is my desire to honor you Lord with all my heart I worship you and all I have within me I give you Lord oh your mercy never fails me and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me free fire and in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been is right. 
In all my life you have been faithful In all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see of the goodness of God As we come to the end of our time together, just to remind you there's the opportunity for, for prayer ministry and uh, Abby um, mentioned some things. There may be other things that uh, you'd like to come and share and receive prayer for. Don't forget on Thursday we have the opportunity for uh, a time of vibrant worship together following Thursday, week Thursday, that time where we can worship together. But right now, we're going to take that survival kit with us. <coughs> Go and live as whole life worshippers. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, fasted 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, yet without sin, Give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your spirit. And as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honourable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent, and worthy of praise. In Jesus' name. Amen.